So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX uh, colloquium. <clears throat> Today's speaker, you can see him on the screen, is Dr. Anwar Wahed. He's currently the director of the Data Intensive Research Initiative of South Africa, also known as uh, SDRISA. Anwar is a, is a computer scientist with a couple of decades of, uh, of experience. <clears throat> At some stage in his career, he was the head of department of computer science at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, he also worked at the CSIR in the, <clears throat> as leader of ICT for the Earth Observation Research Group. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, and a few other uh, steps in, uh, in his career. Yeah, uh, he's been responsible for the <clears throat> A national strategy for big data for, for big data for research. He's the editor of uh, of several data science related journals, and serves on many local and international uh, committees in the field of of data sciences. Yeah. <clears throat> and today, he will give us a talk on uh, <clears throat> on the RISA itself as a national infrastructure for data democracy. Anbar, thank you very much for your time. We are very grateful for for your presentation, you're welcome to start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Petriccioni. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present again. Um, and as the title uh, suggests, my focus is not so much on the scholarly aspects of data science, but rather about what the is all about. And then there's uh, also a second part to my presentation, if time permits, uh, when I'll be making some remarks about uh, open data, open science, and so on, uh, which uh, is very closely linked to uh, the topic that you see on the screen. So uh, without any further ado, uh, just by way of introduction, as uh, Professor Petruccioni mentioned, uh, the RISA is a national uh, initiative sponsored by, funded by the Department of Science and Innovation, and we are managed by the CSIR. Um, we also form part of a bigger organization called the National Integrated Cyber Infrastructure System, or NICIS for short. And uh, what you see on the screen is the usual slide that is shown uh, to illustrate the role of DIRISA together with other uh, components, other areas like the CHBC and Sandrin, uh, together we form the, the technological component of, of, of NICIS. And as the slide shows, the picture shows, uh, the whole purpose of NICIS is to support uh, research in various um, thematic areas that are listed there, as you can see. So uh, on the left also, a little bit of information about how DIRISA sees itself, um, its mission or vision, as we researchers use the DIRISA data commons to share and reuse and, and combine data from other disciplines and of course, the same disciplines. So that's a little bit about DIRISA. Um, our objectives, very briefly, we've got four of them. Uh, the most important one, priority one for us is of course the first one, and that is to build, maintain, develop, um, and deploy uh, what we call a national research data infrastructure. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about this, in fact, much of the presentation focuses on the first objective. Then there are other supporting objectives, uh, such as coordinating the development of skills and expertise uh, in the data sciences, um, and then to advocate the uh, use, 
of um, appropriate data management practices for uh, research data. And then also we provide some uh, strategic advice, if you'd like to call it that, um, for uh, various strategies and frameworks and policies, um, usually uh, requested by the Department of Science and Innovation. Um, on the right hand side, you see some of the activities pertaining to the objectives on the left. Uh, we've developed a big data strategy. We've been involved in the development of the open science policy framework. And I'll say a little bit more about that. We collaborate with quite a number of organizations uh, globally and locally. And there are a number of events that we also um, organize and host. <laughs> on an annual basis to uh, involve uh, especially users. <clears throat> um, then further up, I'm going from the bottom up, uh, we are coordinating what is called the eScience Masters, uh, run by a consortium of universities. And then we have several other uh, skills development or training events that we uh, coordinate and host at some times. Most importantly is the top one, uh, developing and providing what we call hot storage and cold storage repositories and the services that go uh, along and that support the use and the utilization of these two kinds of uh, repositories. And uh, much of the presentation will be about this very first um, objective. So here is a snippet from the DERISA website. If you go to the URL that is shown there, derisa.ac.za, uh, you will see at some point uh, in the, on the web page, you will see something as shown uh, uh, on in this picture. And what this shows is the different uh, collection of different services that the RISA is providing for the research community, uh, uh, firstly for in South Africa. And then on the far right, you see some pictures of uh, the equipment uh, the, that makes up part of the infrastructure. The top one there is uh, the hot storage. It's an eight petabyte storage facility. Uh, and again, I'll say a bit more about that. And then the bottom one is a 20 petabyte cold storage uh, um, equipment, uh, mainly for archiving important uh, research data collections. So yeah, as I mentioned, the focus will mostly be on the provision of the services, some of which that uh, you see on, on the screen uh, and that will be shown on the website if you go to this particular uh, link. So conceptually, uh, if you're technically inclined and you, oops, you want to see what goes on uh, below the the surface. Um, this gives an idea of um, how the different systems fit together. And importantly, you can see there that we actually also link very closely to the CHPC compute systems. They provide, of course, high performance computing uh, infrastructure. So um, going from left to right, there's a very uh, fast link, I think it's 100 gigabits per second, uh, between storage systems at the CHPC and storage systems uh, on the DERISA side. And that link is mostly used to transfer data between the compute systems and the storage systems uh, of DERISA. We use a, a, a virtualized storage management system called IRODS. Um, which allows us to federate and hook up uh, various kinds of um, storage uh, systems uh, to DERISA. What you see here are the two main uh, 
storage uh, volumes that I mentioned previously, the eight petabyte uh, storage for active data or hot storage, and then the 20 petabyte um, cold store. And uh, of course, if you would like, you can call this a storage hierarchy. Uh, the closer you get to the compute systems, the faster and smaller uh, the storage volumes become. So this is a, yeah, a, a, a very uh, high level conception of, of how um, our systems fit together. So in order to um, contextualize the role of DERISA, it can be compared to similar organizations uh, internationally. Um, there's the ARDC in Australia, JISC in the UK, and UDET, uh, which actually comprises a number of federated repositories for the different countries in Europe. So we've used a uh, tiered uh, approach to organize um, or to conceptualize storage facilities uh, globally and locally. And you can see there that the RISA uh, federates into or links into SANSA, South African National Space Agency, SION, uh, ILIFU. These are three examples of uh, storage infrastructures that we link to. And then at the tier three level, you can also have university uh, repositories. So these tiers are merely there to give some level of structure or organization to um, DERISA and to give some, con sorry, some context uh, in terms of where DERISA uh, fits in uh, from a national uh, and an international perspective. So in summary for this slide, uh, the RISA is a national research data uh, service provider and infrastructure. This uh, slide lists some of the services um, that we uh, have deployed already. So these are in use uh, by a number of uh, users countrywide. I'll, I'll show a slide later on with some of the uh, main users uh, to give an idea of the utilization of, 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 uh, of the research uh, repositories. So there's a subscription service together with a single sign-on that combines the two and a picture of this will be shown uh, later on. And this service, uh, the user interface uh, is provided for users to sign up. And when you do sign up, there's a default amount of 100 uh, gigabits, gigabytes of storage that a user gets allocated. And there's provision uh, to request more storage. Uh, there's a, a process, application process for that. More about that later on. The most important service is the data deposit tool um, that is used to upload, uh, the users uh, upload, manage, uh, share data collections, data sets uh, as they choose. Uh, you can share data with, um, for example, uh, groups of researchers working together on a particular project. That's usually the, the uh, main use of the data deposit tool. Um, and you determine, the user determines to a large extent, to all extents, uh, how that data, particular data sets are shared. There's a data management planning tool. And this has been adopted by several universities who now requires the use of this uh, a tool to develop a data management plan, especially for um, services uh, that are funded by some or other funding agency. There's a requirement 
Uh, for example, the NRF um, requires a data management plan for some of the um, research, uh, funded research projects. <clears throat> the long-term archive is the one that was shown as a 20 petabyte storage facility. There's a, an interface that allows uh, the user to store, to submit data, important research data that can be stored for a long period. Then there are two um, DOI services. Uh, one is um, uh, provided by data site. You may be aware of the, the service provider. And then another one that we are now currently um, developing and uh, which will free us from um, having to pay a subscription fee every year. Uh, to data site to make use of their services. So that is still in development. Hopefully deployment will be before the end of March. And then there's DShare, a, spe a service specifically aimed at uh, the provision and the publication of what we would call open data. Um, and these uh, data sets or collections they are automatically uh, assigned a DOI or a handle, as we call it more generally. And then what we are working on currently are research environments for various uh, disciplines, for example, bioinformatics. Uh, we are uh, busy deploying machine learning tools like TensorFlow and Keras that can be accessed through the uh, through the uh, research, uh, the data portal at DRISA. And then much of our work is focused on federating other resources, uh, data resources from various um, universities, for example, uh, into DRISA. The intent here with the last one is to provide a sort of a one-stop shop if you were looking for data on a specific discipline or application then there would be a catalog of uh, research data sources that can be um, searched and browsed. So we're working on those two additional services at the moment. Well, it's quite simple to sign up uh, as a DRISA user. All you have to do is uh, go to the uh, URL shown at the top, uh, and you will be presented with the interface that you see on the right. Uh, and this GUI allows you to log in or sign up um, if you uh, haven't gotten, uh, if you're not subscribed yet. So it's a fairly simple process. We try to minimize the amount of data that needs to be, the amount of information that needs to be provided. I think it's just your full name, your email address and institution that you are with. So signing up is a fairly uh, painless process, quick process. And once you have been signed up, you have this 100 gigabytes of storage um, and you can decide how you want to share your data. And then also, as a registered or subscribed users, you can then have access to the various uh, services that uh, was mentioned in the in the in the previous slide. Um, and uh, to anticipate a question later on, um, all of these services are free. Uh, the asterisk there just implies if you're not related to a particular public institution like a university or a research council, then there might be a cost associated uh, with the subscription. But for university staff um, and all researchers in public uh, institutions, uh, for them, uh, this particular service, these all these services are, are free. So here's a picture of DShare. This is what you will see, the GUI um, that you need to complete to store 
or, or publish and share data and data that is stored this way would be open uh, and quite visible uh, to the general community uh, making use of the RISA. <clears throat> the data management planning tool, um, as I mentioned earlier on, it's required by certain funders. And the good thing about this is that you can now Re refer to data sets in publications uh, and otherwise, um, and you can uh, cite them by, by, by uh, citing the, the DOI that would be associated with the various data sets that you uh, plan on generating uh, or producing at some point of your research. Uh, and there are various other advantages as, as uh, mentioned, uh, on the left-hand side. This slide shows some of the users, uh, prominent users of the DIRISA storage facilities, uh, repositories. Uh, South African Medical Research Council is using quite a lot of storage. And much of these, the data that they store is um, encrypted um, and it's well uh, guarded, uh, very secure. Uh, there are no, there's very little chance that data can be accessed um, um, illegally <clears throat> or uh, without authority. And then you see there's some other uh, activities. Ilifu is a project uh, hosted by the UCT and other a consortium led by UCT, focusing on astronomy, climate modeling. Uh, you can see there's quite a heavy use of the DIRISA infrastructure by the CSIR, Kemba Labs, you probably know it's a nuclear uh, uh, physics uh, focused lab. Uh, SARIL, uh, the POMIX is one of the SARIL um, initiatives that is currently um, um, being conducted by a number of universities. And then there are individuals at various universities actually using, um, utilizing the DIRISA uh, storage facility. Uh, here, the last one here is another research infrastructure uh, for whom we also host um, quite a, a fair number, fair amount of data. Yeah, uh, to anticipate some questions, possibly at, towards the end. Um, these are usually questions that, uh, oops, that are asked uh, when the research services are presented. So for hot data, we've got two sites, one in Cape Town, one in Pretoria. Um, and these two sites basically mirror uh, the content of each other. Um, there's um, updates nightly. Um, and then within each site, there's also various kinds of um, redundancy mechanisms. Um, uh, it's fair to say there's probably three copies of every data item stored somewhere. Then uh, cold data is a tape driven system. Uh, complying with LTO7 standards, uh, which amongst others includes regularly, regular integrity checks and, and so on. Who has access to your data? Well, just you. Uh, system administrators uh, would normally not have access to the content of file names. This is important. Um, especially when it comes to uh, personal data, which is the next point. Uh, if one stores personal data at, at DIRISA, um, then the onus and the responsibility would be on the user to either anonymize or encrypt such files. And we do not recommend that such kinds of data be stored um, at DIRISA unless there's a good um, uh, reason for it. <clears throat> what can I store? Well, uh, any kind of data 
uh, we would like to avoid uh, users uh, utilizing this resource for personal reasons. Um, and so uh, a, a lot of trust is um, put into uh, the integrity of the users. Can you process your data? Well, yes. Uh, the previous slide showed the link between CHPC compute services. And usually what happens is that there's some other appliance like a VM running on our um, cloud-based um, OpenStack platform that users can access uh, remotely. And then this particular appliance like a virtual machine can then access data that's stored at Teresa. Why should you bother with Teresa instead of the usual uh, storage repositories out there? Well, that will become, I hope, uh, clear uh, in the next few slides. Okay, so now I turn to the open part or the democracy part concerning data. And uh, to contextualize open data, it's important to understand uh, the notion of open science. And you'll see from the slide, from the picture there that open data is one component of, of, of uh, the open science concept. And similarly, uh, open access would be also uh, another component. So open data and open access are there, or they underpin uh, the practice of, of open science. And this is our, uh, just for clarity, our perspectives. So delving a little bit deeply, deeper into open science, uh, why bother? Uh, why should I share my hard work and uh, my time that I put into my research, uh, why should I make it open? Well, there are a number of um, uh, reasons why, and you see these on, on the screen. Um, and um, there is an underpinning issue here as well. Uh, um, I think there is a further slide that goes into that kind of detail. But there are quite a number of uh, strategic values that can be had from um, the practice of, of open science. It is a global trend. We see this uh, across the world, uh, various organizations. There are various strategic uh, uh, statements by various uh, global international organizations like UNESCO, uh, the US, uh, there's also the Berlin Declaration uh, and various other international organiza organizations like the OECD, uh, CoData and so on, who actively advocate and promote the adoption of open science. And uh, one can be fairly uh, confident that it will, well, it does. Uh, there are plans uh, in motion already to implement uh, open science uh, in South Africa. Why bother? Well, this is what the data democracy is about. Um, we know that there's uh, lots of money invested in the acquisition and uh, the, the generation of, of research data. Um, there are also issues of data sovereignty that needs to be considered. And this is in part an answer to the earlier uh, item <clears throat> that was mentioned in the earlier slide. Why bother and why not use uh, Google or Dropbox or similar sort of uh, cloud-based repositories. Well, you need to think about who controls your data. Um, what laws apply to your data? 
a very important issue to also consider is um, the integrity of, of publications, the last point made there. Uh, we have seen, and you can see on some of the, uh, on the pictures on the, on the right hand side, there's an increase in uh, retractions of uh, papers, submissions, and even uh, reputable and prominent journals like Nature and Science. Uh, there has been an increase. It has been managed uh, up to a point, as you can see from the graph there, but uh, developments in AI like uh, chat GPT and uh, other large language model uh, applications have now um, yeah, opened the can of worms, I suppose. Um, and so this graph will have probably, uh, there would probably not be a trend downwards. So one of the most important reasons then is to have data openly and publicly available to support your publications. Uh, you are probably aware that some journals are already requiring that for publication of, of, of uh, papers. And uh, the good news is that one can get acknowledgement for data, uh, uh, pro the provision of data sets um, there's a concept called alt metrics that go beyond this uh, earlier uh, uh, current version of uh, notion of, of uh, bibliometrics um, in order to provide some level of credit or acknowledgement um, for open data. And then importantly, uh, open data as shown previously uh, underpins the, the, the practice of open science. Uh, also shown on the right hand side is one example of a journal uh, focused on data. So one can get uh, that kind of recognition in the same way that one gets um, recognition for um, research publications. So the important issue here is that this notion of open science uh, to a large extent mitigates against the traditional perspective uh, of uh, data uh, and generating data. Uh, usually uh, as, a, as a scholar, or researcher, one spends quite a lot of time generating or acquiring data, formatting that data. And it's fair then to think that, uh, well, given all the time and effort that you spent in preparing and formatting the data, pre-processing it, or wrangling it, as they say, uh, that um, there's now an assumption that the data is yours. Well, not quite, um, but this idea does require a shift in um, mindset over the traditional perspective that you know, the data that's generated by the professor, or sorry, my apologies to all professors, <laughs> um, that the data actually belongs to a, a particular individual. So it's important then to also have an open mind uh, when um, considering notions of open data and open science. What has been done in South Africa uh, over the past uh, three or so years is that uh, a framework for open science has been developed uh, various thematic areas have been identified. Uh, on the right hand side is a piece or extract from that particular framework. Um, and this framework was developed in close collaboration with the European Union uh, or some European Union organizations, specifically the European Open Science Cloud, European e e uh, EOSC. 
So there was quite a lot of interaction and discussions uh, with them and other global organizations in the development of this framework. <clears throat> Ensuing from this framework has been what is called the South African Open Science Cloud Roadmap. So there is a list of um, activities uh, in implementing a uh, system platform, cyber infrastructure platform that will support open science uh, nationally and otherwise. And this responsibility has been given to uh, NICIS, the National Integrated Cyber Infrastructure System. So we are busy uh, deploying, implementing an open science cloud and some of the components that was described previously um, are, are contribute to the development of, of this particular um, infrastructure. Then uh, I think close to conclusion now, um, given uh, the strategic priority, the strategic um, intent to move towards an open science uh, paradigm, if you like, uh, we do realize that some data can never be open, of course. And we have adopted this particular data access model, that is Teresa. Um, and we prefer that data at the RISA be either shared amongst groups conducting research or be completely open, which is uh, the figure on the far right. There are other uh, levels of access, uh, but these are the two uh, levels or kinds of types of access that we um, encourage amongst our users. So this is, thank you, uh, my presentation. I, I hope it was useful and thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, Anva, for the clear presentation on the role of DIRISA and what it offers. Let me ask the audience in Stellenbosch if they have questions and then we can move to the participants online. Any questions from here? Any users? Here we go. Uh, thank you very much for that very clear um, talk. I just want to, to clarify, uh, do you have agreement from a broad set of journals, all journals, that basically when a journal requires a publish, somebody who's publishing an article, that they make their, their data openly available, that if you say you put it on Derisa, that will be, that will be sufficient for them? No, we don't. That we we our position is that we would see that as largely the responsibility of the author of whatever publication uh, is uh, relevant, or the journal itself. What we provide is a place where data can be stored and then the service for allocating a reference, a DOI two particular data sets. So researchers and authors are then free to quote that particular, DO, cite that particular DOI as a reference to the data sets. Our plan is also to generalize this to beyond data, but also to um, software or um, algorithms, uh, related code and so on as well. For now, uh, DOIs or handles can be requested. We generate them, and then the user will have the freedom to um, cite those DOIs in their publications. Um, we do have recognition specifically through DataCite um, as what they call a trusted repository. That means, um, uh, uh, that uh, data or, or, or DOIs uh, generated for data sets stored at, um, at DIRISA 
is is um, recognized and acknowledged uh, at least by the by by data side. Not sure whether I've answered your question. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I mean, I may maybe uh, didn't make myself sufficiently clear, but my understanding is that journals uh, have there will be certain places where they will accept that that data can be placed uh, to meet their criteria, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if they that you have any sort of agreement with journals that that is will, will apply to Derisa, but perhaps I'm misunderstanding the, the situation. Okay. Yeah, so my understanding is that um, the, these accepted repositories um, as, as, as um, recognized by some journals, um, they are, the, the accepted repositories are not really classified by the journal, but rather by the WDS, the World Data System. They provide a list of what they call trusted repositories. Um, and to become a trusted repository, you have to comply with quite a number of onerous requirements. The RISA is recognized as a trusted repository. Whether a journal, a particular journal makes use of that kind of uh, certification, it's actually a certification process, to become a trusted repository, uh, that is up to the journal. Um, but we don't, the RISA does not have any kind of agreement with any journal um, on uh, <clears throat> whether they can or cannot be quoted as uh, or cited as, as a resource for data. Um, and we see to a large extent this as a as some uh, a responsibility that uh, the author would have. So the author would, in his or her publication, cite a DOI, which points to data that is stored at the RISA. Uh, if there's a requirement by certain journals uh, to quote only specific repositories, there's no, the RISA is not, a, um, is not uh, uh, in the business of uh, going to that level. Uh, does that help? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Any other questions from the audience here? No? Uh, let me see if there are any questions from the audience online. I asked a second ago. Uh, no, it doesn't seem to be the case. It doesn't seem to be the case. Ah. Uh-huh. Sorry, I didn't see that. <clears throat> ah, ah, here we go. Um, ah, here is a question. Uh, how does the RISA position itself to avoid duplication efforts in the landscape of existing and emerging platforms, particularly in relation to South African initiatives like those of Sansa, Sion, and Sanbi? Good question. Um, firstly, the RISA is not in the business to take over or the management or the hosting of data sets everywhere or data sets at a particular organization. For example, we have an agreement with SANSA that we can um, include in our catalog URLs, links to data that sits somewhere else. So there would be, uh, for example, for the case of, of SANSA, there would be a whole host of data sets that they host, uh, that they that is stored at Sansa. It is not our intent, the research intent, to um, save that data at our repositories, not unless there's a specific requirement 
perhaps they want data to be mirrored, perhaps they want data to be backed up. But in general, the catalog that we are developing right now in the search and browse facilities would list uh, links to data that is stored somewhere else as well. So in that way, we see ourselves as federating uh, into data repositories uh, at different places, sensors, one, um, universities, for example. Um, and all that is needed is an agreement uh, with the particular institutions that we can do this. And this is what we have been doing with, uh, for example, SANSA and, and, and ELIFU. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Anwar. It seems there are no more questions on this side. So Anwar, thank you very much for introducing the RISA and the services it offers and the role that it plays in the Nietzsche system. So a pity that you're not here with us. Otherwise, I would have invited you to have a, to share a snack with us outside the venue. <laughs> but hopefully, you will visit us in Stellenbosch uh, very soon. So thank you very much for your time and for the nice presentation. Thank you very much. Have a good thank evening. You.